Hello, everyone. Uh, so today we have a talk by uh, Carlos Sinelli from the University of Washington. He's going to be giving a talk on uh, transparent and robust causal inference in the social and health sciences. In the Q&A, we actually have Chad Hazlitt from UCLA, who was a co-author, who will help with answering some questions. And the discussant is our very own Hido Imbets. So um, without further ado, I'm going to switch it over to Ying, who is going to be handling questions. Thanks, Emma. Uh, so please submit your questions in the Q&A session instead of the chat uh, button. Um, I think Carlos will uh, stop for uh, one to two times to answer some of the questions, and Chad will help with other questions. Yeah. I think I can uh, hand out to Carlos. Okay, so let me try to share my slides. Just one second. All right, so can you see the slides? Yeah, perfect. All right, now let me just move you here so I can also see the slides. Just a quick second. This is the usual. Zoom thing. All right. So, well, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. I'm a big fan of the online causal inference uh, seminar, and this is really a great honor uh, to be here. So I'm Carl Sanelli, an assistant professor of statistics at the University of Washington. And today I want to talk to you about sensitivity analysis in causal inference. So now before you jump on me on this title, transparent and robust causal inference, <laughs> I chose that for a reason. I, I want to bring certain neglected aspects of causal inference that has been around forever, uh, such as partial identification, sensitivity analysis, to the forefront of research practice. So I would like to start us, I would like us to start thinking uh, of sensitivity and partial identification as a necessary step for more transparent causal inferences. And, and, and that's just the reason I, I chose this title, right? Okay, so now that said, I, so we have a lot of people here and I cannot guess everyone's background. So I would like to get, give a brief motivation to put everyone in the same page. Uh, and then we're gonna get to the actual papers, okay? So I'd like to first motivate the importance of sensitivity analysis with a, a very famous real example that not only captures the essence of the problem uh, that we would like to discuss, but actually had an enormous impact in public policy. And that's the debate on cigarette smoking and lung cancer that took place in the late 1950s and early 1960s. So back then, observational studies found a strong association between smoking and cancer. So smokers had nine times the risk of non-smokers to develop lung cancer. So this naturally leads to the question, is this association causal? So not everyone agree with this claim. And in fact, one of, votes, one of its most fierce opponents was Sir Ronald Fisher, and Fisher argued that we could not rule out that an observed common cause explained the observed association. So this is an actual quote from an actual paper from, from Fisher. And theoretically, Fisher is right because observational data alone cannot distinguish between the first model and the second model. And to those of you uh, who are new to causal inference, I would like to emphasize that this is true no matter how big the data you have, or no matter how deep the neural network you fit, you simply cannot tell both models apart. So how can we move this debate forward? An important piece of the smoking and cancer debate is what we usually now call sensitivity analysis. And it consists of the following hypothetical exercise. So we're gonna suppose for a moment that Fisher hypothesis is true, that in fact, cigarette smoking does not cause lung cancer at all. And now we're gonna ask ourselves the following hypothetical question. How strong would an observed confounding need to be to explain all that observed association? So that's what quite a few colleagues computed in this beautiful paper. And they concluded that if smokers had nine times the risk of non-smokers to develop lung cancer, and this is not because cigarette smoking is an actual causal agent, then this has a strong logical implication. This means that this, is, this unobserved confounder, such as a gene or hormone, or whatever else you can think about, would need to be at least nine times more prevalent in smokers than in non-smokers. So the opinion of the experts at the time 
was that no gene or hormone could possibly be the tightly linked to such a complex behavior such as smoking. So they judged Fisher hypothesis to be implausible. So the conclusion of our exercise here is that an observed confounding cannot explain all the observed association, and there must be at least some causal path between cigarette smoking and lung cancer. And why, why do I like this example? So I think it brings two general lessons uh, that, that we can take from it. So the first one, which is of course well known to most cause inference researchers, but I think it, it, it's worth repeating to the general public is that although machine learning is a super hot topic now, machine learning is all about associations. Now, of course, we are in the online cause inference seminar. So perhaps we have some vested interest in saying that. So here I'm bringing a quote from Yasha Benju, uh, who just won the Turing Award for his work in deep learning. And Benju is saying that deep learning is good at finding patterns in the data, but can't explain how they're connected. And that's usually what we want to know. Many, if not most scientific questions we are interested in are causal questions, such as the effect of cigarette smoking on lung cancer, or another important topic, the role of anthropogenic factors in global warming, or at least in my biased opinion, all these COVID-19 related questions are causal questions in, its, in their essence. And for all these questions, machine learning or statistical learning is not enough. We need causal models. <laughs> but now comes the second but. Yes, we do need causal models, but despite the rapid and unprecedented, let's say award-winning progress in causal inference. So for example, we just had recently the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, to, to Guido Wimbens, Josh Angrens, and David Card for among other things, their groundbreaking work on quasi-experimental designs, which are now very popular in statistics, statistics and econometrics and, and part of the credibility revolution. And coming from computers, mostly from computer science, we had the development of causal graphical models with a complete solution to several non-parametric identification problems. But despite all, all this progress, uh, most of traditional causal inference, I'm not saying all, of course, we have uh, scholars that have worked on, uh, for a long time on partial identification assistive and analysis, but as most of the traditional causal inference in practice, it still relies on strong exact assumptions such as the absence of unobserved confounders, and the absence of uh, certain direct effects. And the truth is that hardly anyone believes that those assumptions hold exactly. And we need tools that make it easy to routinely discuss the sensitivity of our questions when our assumptions are called, uh, of our estimates, sorry, when our assumptions are called into question, just like it happens in the smoking and cancer in the debate. So there will always be a feature questioning uh, whether our assumptions are correct or not. So that sets up the stage for the research I want to present to you. So our main general goal is to develop new theory methods and software for permitting causal inferences under more flexible and realistic settings. But more pragmatically, I'm dividing these two in, this going two main projects. So the first one is to develop a, a suite of sensitivity analysis tools for all these widely used quasi-experimental designs. And the idea is to have things that can be immediately put to use by researchers to improve the robustness and transparency of current applied research. Uh, and the second uh, project is to build automated tools to incorporate more credible or, or let's say non-standard constraints on, on causal models beyond those exclusion and independence restrictions. Now for this talk, I'll focus mostly on this first uh, project. Essentially, I'll discuss sensitivity tools for our old friend ordinarily squares and instrumental variable regressions. And if time permits, we can discuss a little bit of the, of the second project. Okay, so now let's get started on the papers. Uh, so now I'm gonna discuss a suite of sensitivity and analysis tools for ordinarily squares. Uh, this is based on, on the paper with Chad Hazlett, who is also with us uh, today. Uh, the paper is called Making Sense of Sensitivity Extended Omitted Variable Bias, and it has been published last year on GRSSP. Uh, but before I dive into details of the paper, let's just uh, get a brief overview of the state of sensitivity analysis uh, to an observed confounding today. <laughs> now, some of these views are actually now getting outdated already, and that's for a good reason, because this is rapidly changing, okay? Uh, so although often praised, so it's hard to find anyone that, that, that is going to say, well, we do, should not perform sensitivity analysis. Everyone almost agree that we should do it. For some reason, this is still rarely practiced. And we're not just saying that, we actually verified that, for example, in the top three uh, general audience journals in political science, only 6% of the papers 
performed some sort of formal sensitivity analysis and other authors found similar numbers in economics and epidemiology. And we believe there are some factors that contribute to this low peak. So the first one is that many of the previous proposals for sensitivity analysis would require the user to make some strong auxiliary assumptions regarding the nature of the unobserved confounder and how it, it is related to the uh, treatment and the outcome uh, equations, for example. So for example, you need to assume that you have a binary unobserved confounder and then it, it's linked to the treatment through uh, logistic regression and so on. And we found that most users feel uneasy about that because they are trying to relax assumptions and now we're asking them to make these auxiliary assumptions to perform sensitivity analysis. So that can be an impediment to this widespread adoption. Uh, another uh, factor is that for some time, we left some simple sensitivity measures that users could readily apply and routinely report to summarize robustness to systematic biases. So we are all used to reporting p-values and confidence intervals to summarize simply uncertainty. Can't we have similar tools to summarize robustness to unobserved confounders uh, that can, we can routinely report in our regression tables, just like we report a p-value? And finally, probably the most important, it's usually difficult to connect the formal results uh, of the sensitivity analysis to a cogent argument to uh, about which confounders are plausible or not. And some of the previous proposals offered by the literature, although they were in the right direction, trying to leverage knowledge of relative importance, uh, they could lead uh, users to erroneous conclusions. So that's what we're going to try to tackle on this paper. And to show our tools, I want to bring you another uh, real-world example. So I'm going to be doing this all the time. Uh, and this time, the example comes from political science. And I think it's because it's since, since sensitivity analysis requires expert judgment, it's easier to explain within the context of an example. So now our research question here is to understand how exposure to violence changed individual attitudes toward peace during the Darfur conflicts of 2003 to 2004. Specifically, we want to know whether this direct exposure to violence made individuals angry and thus more likely to ask for revenge, or did it make them wary and thus more likely to ask for peace? Now, since this is a causal question, we cannot answer without assumptions. And the main assumption here is that government bombings and attacks by the militia were indiscriminate within village, with one major unfortunate, uh, very unfortunate exception, because we know from the reports that there was targeting based on gender due to widespread uh, sexual assault. So in other words, we are positing that village and gender are sufficient for control of confounding, and that potentially we can estimate the causal effect of direct harm on our measure of peace index, which I'm calling here peace factor, with the following regression model. And if you run this regression, we find a large and statistically significant effect, suggesting that those who were directly harmed became on average more per piece, not less. Okay, but now the problem of the previous estimate is that it relies on the assumption of unconfoundedness, right? And not all investigators may agree with this hypothesis. So for instance, after you write up your results and you submit to a journal, you will find out that reviewer two thinks that yes, okay, maybe the bombing was a crude instrument, but they could target the center versus the periphery of the village. And those on the center might also have different attitudes toward peace to begin with. So you should have at least adjusted for whether the individual lived on the center or on the periphery. So basically what the reviewer is saying is that you should have run this regression instead of the other regression. And to complicate things, reviewer three not only agrees with reviewer two, but further argues that you should have also have adjusted for wealth and prior political attitudes. And because maybe the attackers could not tell your wealth or political attitudes, but individuals with different wealth or different political attitudes expose themselves to different le levels of dangers. Uh, and also, they might have also different attitudes toward peace to begin with. So you should have adjusted for center, wealth, political attitudes, made complex interaction of all these variables, but none of these variables were measured. So the question we'd like to answer here is how different would our inferences have been had we accounted them for in our analysis? So more precisely, uh, these are the questions we would like to answer with, with our tools. So first, how strong would the particular confounder or group of confounders have to be to change the conclusions of our study? Second, in our worst case scenario, how vulnerable is the study's result to many or all unobserved confounders acting together 
possibly non-linearly. Third, are these compounders or scenarios plausible? Or this is a hard question, so we're going to try to elicit this judgment from this researcher with a different question, which is how strong would these confounders have to be relative to some important observed covariate or covariates, uh, such as female, in order to be problematic? And finally, can we present all these sensitivity results concisely for easy routine reporting, just like we report a p-value or a confidence interval in our regression table? So in this paper, we develop a suite of sensitivity analysis tools to answer these questions. And uh, one important thing to know here is that these tools use only information already computed by regression software, and they do not require any extra modeling assumptions beyond the assumptions you already committed with when you ran the regression in the first place, okay? <clears throat> so, so that we cannot avoid, of course, whether the regression is demand is your target estimate of inference. So, so that's a separate question. Um, okay, so let's see how we can answer these questions directly in our example. Uh, so this table forms our proposal for a minimal sensitivity reporting. So we're gonna start by replicating the usual statistics you, you would see in a regression table, such as the point estimate, the standard error, and the T value. And now I'm only asking you to compute a couple extra quantities to summarize robustness to systematic biases. And these simple sensitivity statistics already tells us a lot about the sensitivity of our estimates. So, so let's start with the partial square with the treatment uh, with the outcome. So for those who do not remember what a partial square is, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, this quantity measures how much residual variation of the outcome our treatment explains after taking into account uh, the what the observed covariates explain. But what is perhaps not well known is that uh, the partial R square is also an extreme, uh, is a sensitivity statistic to an extreme scenario. And specifically, this partial R square of 2.2% is telling us that in an extreme scenario, even if confounders explained all remaining variation of the outcome, they would still need to explain at least 2.2% of the residual variation of the treatment to bring down the estimated effect to zero. So this condition is, is the analogous of the nine times of the corner field condition for the smoking cancer debate. So without imposing any constraints on how strongly associated the omitted variable is with the outcome, this is the bare minimal strength that this confounder must satisfy to logically account for the estimated effect. Uh, but the partial square may be to an extreme scenario because we're not imposing any constraints on how much variation uh, this confounder explains uh, of the outcome. So this leads us to the other quantity we are proposing, the robustness value. <laughs> and the robustness value of 13.9% is telling us that if confounders explain 13.9%, both of the residual variation of the outcome and of the treatment, this compound is sufficiently strong to explain away uh, the observed effect. Moreover, at least one of these associations needs to be greater than 13.9%. Otherwise, such confounders cannot logically explain away the point estimate. Uh, we can generalize both of these metrics uh, to, to take into account sampling uncertainty. So for example, here is the robustness value considering, considering a signif significance level of 5%. And, and then the robustness values, of course, reduces uh, to 7.6% now because we're considering both systematic biases and sampling uncertainty at the same time. So know here that we already answered the first and second questions that we had posed. And these metrics communicate succinctly what we need to believe about the observed confounders in order to sustain our original claim of this study. But now we have the hard part of sensitivity analysis, which is the possibility of judgment. And we cannot escape from that if, if we want to move forward beyond describing what we need to believe, right? So we need to judge whether uh, these values of 2.2% at 13.9% are good news and bad news. And it's important to note here that statistics itself cannot answer this question for us. This is where expert knowledge needs to come in. So our job as a methodologist or statistician is to try to help elicit the proper expert knowledge from making this judgment. So in particular, what we're gonna try to do here is to bound the strength of an unobserved confounder with the same strength or a multiple of the strength as an important observed covariate uh, that we have in, in our data set. In our example, for instance, it turns out that a confounder as strong as female in explaining both treatment and outcome variation 
could at most explain 12% of the residual variation of the outcome and 1% of the residual variation of the treatment. Now, since both of those numbers are below the robustness value of 13.9%, the table reveals that uh, the point estimate is robust to a confounder as strong as female. In addition, since the bound of 1% is less than the partial square of 2.2%, we can also conclude that the point estimate is robust to a worst case confounder as strongly associated with the treatment as female, but otherwise arbitrarily related to the outcome. Finally, and this is a new thing, <laughs> we are trying it out. One last thing we can do is to replace the usual critical value for statistical significance, say 1.96 for 5% significance level, with an adjusted critical value that accounts both for sampling uncertainty and systematic biases, in this case, systematic biases as strong as, uh, as female. Uh, and we are calling this T dagger here, but we're open to suggestions on how to call this new T adjusted T value. And since the observed T value of 4.818 is greater than our adjusted critical value of 2.8, we, we can also conclude that statistical significance is still would be preserved even after adjusting for a measure confounders as strong as female. So why are we making these relative comparisons? Well, in our running example, so that's where expert knowledge comes in, uh, one could have a reasonable argument that unfortunately, of course, gender was potentially one of the most important factors to explain whether you were har exposed to harm or not. So if you agree with the claim that it's unlikely that residual confounding can be as strong as female, then you also must conclude that these confounders cannot logically account for the observed effect. But now, of course, this is up to debate. And the idea of sensitivity is to discipline this debate and not to give a, a final answer. This is robust, this is not robust, and, and so on. It's actually to to bring expert knowledge to the table. Okay, so uh, all these results that I showed you, they are exact for single confounders. They're, they're, they're actually just algebra of OLS. And moreover, they are conservative for multiple possibly nonlinear confounders. So we can use the same table or, or the same quantities to reason about multiple confounders. And what happens here is that if you have a group of confounders that explain that much uh, residual variation, that's the worst bias that they could cause. Uh, so as we have seen, this minimal sensitivity reporting already answers a lot of the questions that we had posed about sensitivity analysis, <laughs> but we can further refine our sensitivity analysis with visual tools that explores the whole sensitivity range of point estimates and p-values. So that's what I want to show you now. So that's uh, uh, the first plot I want to show is a sensitivity contour plot of the point estimate, heavily inspired by the, actually a, an Imbens paper from 2003. So in X-axis here, we have the, uh, how strongly the confounder is associated with the treatment. In the Y-axis, we have how strongly the confounder, hypothetical confounder, of course, uh, is associated with the outcome. And both of these axes are measured in terms of partial square, indicating how much of the percentage, uh, the percentage of unexplained variance of the treatment and the outcome that these confounders explain. So for each pair of partial square, we have a contour line indicating the exact point S when you would have obtained if you could run the regression with that confounder. Assuming, of course, a, a direction of the bias that hurts uh, our preferred hypothesis. You could flip these two if you want the bias to increase your estimate instead of decreasing your estimate. And starting from the bottom left, we have the original estimate of 0 0.098, which assumes no unobserved confounder. So this is the... Un uh, the estimate under the assumption of unconfoundedness. And as we move along the diagonal, we are hypothesizing confounders with uh, increasingly, increasingly stronger confounders to the point of eventually flipping the sign of our estimate. And then we would conclude that actually the effect is negative and not positive, for, for example. And these red diamonds here indicate the maximum strength of confounders once, twice, or three times as strong as uh, female and explain both treatment and outcome variation. So uh, for the point estimate, <laughs> uh, these confounders would still not be strong enough to bring the estimate down to zero, but of course they would substantially reduce the effect size. So this could be important for your theory. So you should be mindful of that. Okay, so not just focusing blindly on, on zero. Now we can make the same sensitivity contour plot for the T value for testing a no hypothesis of zero effect or, or any other no hypothesis. So in this plot, the axes are defined as before. 
but now the cartoon lines indicate the exact value you would have obtained had we run a regression with this unobserved confounder. And note here that the statistical significance is robust for confounding once or twice as strong as female, but now we cannot rule out that confounding three times as strong as female would make the estimate statistically significant. So do we think that confounders might exist that are as strong or stronger than female in predicting whether you were exposed to harm? If so, what are these confounders? So, so the idea here is to move the discussion from a qualitative argument about whether we have perfect identification to a more disciplined quantitative argument that hopefully help researchers think about what are the likely threats to their research designs, okay? Uh, okay, so to recap uh, this, this first part, uh, so instead of arguing whether we have perfect identification or zero confounding, we should be transparent about the amount of confounding necessary to change our conclusions. The idea of these tools is to make this task easier. So using information uh, that you, you can get from your standard regression software and the omitted variable bias framework you're already familiar with, we can compute simple sensitivity measures uh, of point estimates and p-values, either for routine reporting or when reviewing and reading papers. So all these statistics that I showed you, we can actually compute from summary statistics found in regression tables. So you don't need the micro data to perform a sensitivity analysis. Uh, we can use the same framework for single or multiple confounders and, and extreme scenarios. Uh, we can also bound the strength of confounders with the same strength of our mood power of the strength of observed covariates, trying to leverage knowledge of relative importance of variables if you do have that knowledge to, to, to use. And we can explore the series of visualizations to help reasoning whether well, confounders that can change your conclusions can be ruled out or not. Okay, so although these results are recent, they're already being used in different disciplines. So, so, so that's pretty cool. If you, I encourage you to try it out. And if you find something, some feature that you don't see that you would like, please uh, talk to us and we can implement in the software. We have R and Stata packages available. The Python version is still under development, but should be available soon. We actually have a software paper also uh for those who want to to get deeper into the r or stata version and if you type in your browser right now tinyurl.com dash sense maker you can rewatch everything i said with, but with actual r code reproducing this dar for example so next i'm going to talk about instrumental variables so i think this is perhaps a good time for some q a questions before we move on uh, yeah, I see a lot of questions in the Q&A section. Um, uh, um, the first question is, are you not implicitly re-specifying the model based on the data when your approach to sensitivity is applied? And if so, don't you have post model selection challenges to your statistical tests? And maybe that applies to all forms of sensitivity analysis? Well, in this specific case, we are not re-specifying the model because uh, we are starting with the full data model, let's say, where we would hopefully adjust for both the observed covariates and the observed covariates, and we are making inferences based on that. But if someone uh, does run the sensitivity analysis and then realizes, well, it's, this is not this robust, and then re-specify the model and run again until they get a robust result, then I guess you're right. So there would be, I don't know, robustness hacking instead of p-hacking. <laughs> I don't know if we have a term for that already. Uh, so this could be dangerous. So so uh, so yes, I'm, I'm not sure I have a perfect question for this this answer. Uh, a perfect answer to, to this question, but, but it could be, if people misuse this, yes, it could be a problem. Uh, uh, for trying different specifications until you get a quote unquote robust result. Uh, any other questions? Thanks. Um, I think I do have time for one more question. Okay, uh, let's. Uh, there is another question. Uh, is there a sensitivity analysis for the linearity assumption of the effect? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So there are other tools that do not assume a, a linear effect, but they're usually uh, uh, confined to other types of, of approaches. So for example, uh, 
if you have a binary treatment uh, assignment, you could use Rosenbaum's gamma. Uh, if you're using a logistic regression, you, you could use the E value from Tyler Van der Wiel, which I not dis discussed here. Uh, for this type of sensitivity, we are not necessarily assuming that the full model is linear, but for now, we do need the linear separation of the treatment with the rest of the covariate. So, so perhaps we could flexibly fit the uh, covariate model with, I don't know, with double machine learning or something else. But our target of inference is a regression estimate. Uh, well, under some assumption, the regression estimate, even with heterogeneity, can be understood as a as a weighted average of treatment effects, but but our, we are the focus here is on the regression on the sensitivity of the regression estimate, the regression coefficient estimate. Not sure if it answers the question, but hopefully it does. Cool. Uh, mm -hmm. There is a few questions here related to, to sort of heartburn about about linearity. Uh, one person also asked, "This only applies with a correctly specified linear model." Um, and uh, another person says, yeah, this only applies for linear models that, that may not even be used much in observational settings because we might want to use more non-parametric things. Do you want to say anything else about the, the linearity restriction and how it does and, and doesn't bite uh, in what we're doing here? Yeah, so for example, one uh, general, so at least I think one most immediate extension that we can do with this result is extend to a partially linear model and you could, fit the observed covariates flexibly with a data adaptive estimator. Uh, and uh, we could still apply this uh, sensitivity tools to that case. And also, uh, even if the regression coefficient, even if the model is not linear, but if the regression coefficient still represents under some assumptions, uh, a weighted average of causal effects of interest, you could still use that as well, right? So, so we're not discussing specifically the assumptions that allow you to interpret the regression estimate as a causal quantity. Uh, we're discussing how to make sensitivity with this regression estimate once you decided that's your target of interest. Does that make sense? <laughs> Great. Okay, so. Yeah, I think we can. We can yeah, we can discuss more. Yeah. Uh, so now let me move to instrumental variables. So now we're going to discuss a suite of sensitive analysis tools for instrumental variables. And I think the same questions are going to pop up here because uh, the traditional IV estimate may not have the causal interpretation we usually think they have. So we have actually very recent work discussing how we can interpret the IV estimate when you adjust for covariates and when can you have an interpretation of local average treatment effects. Uh, but but for, for here, we're going to assume that the researcher already determined that they are interested in, in estimating this IV estimate, okay? Uh, so this is based on this working paper. So these uh, comments are very welcome. So please send your comments and criticisms. Uh, it's also with Chad Hazler, and it's called an omitted variable bias framework for sensitive analysis of instrumental variables. <laughs> so now again, as I said, sensitive analysis is easier to understand within an example because we need expert knowledge to, to make judgments about these things. So this time I will bring an example from economics, okay? Uh, and our research question here is uh, to understand what is the effect of an extra year of education on someone's earnings? So that's like a traditional question on, on the econometrics literature. And a natural approach to this problem is to run a regression just like we did in, in the previous example. And it would re regress, for example, log earnings Y on our treatment here, which is education, years of education, D. Adjusting for some observed covariates X that you have in a survey, such as race, experience, and regional factors. And he, here we are reproducing the results of a famous paper uh, from David Card. And if we run this regression, this is what we find. We find that each year of education is associated with an increase of 7.5% in earnings. But as we just have seen before, this is likely a biased estimate of the causal effect of interest, of the target estimate of interest, let's say. Uh, because there are many important variables that were not in our survey that, that we know that affect both schooling and earnings, such as family wealth and ability. And our restricted OLS estimate may suffer from uh, omitted variable bias. So what can we do now? So we could do sensitivity analysis, but here we're going to discuss an alternative approach, 
and that's where instrumental variables comes in. So uh, if we can find a variable Z that we usually call the instrument, and this instrument first needs to change this, the incentives to schooling, uh, our, our treatment D. But second, and most importantly, it needs to be otherwise unrelated to earnings, more precisely meaning that Z is only related to our outcome Y because it changes our incentives to, to the treatment education D. Then we can obtain a valid estimate of the cause effect of schooling on earnings, completely avoiding the problem of omitted verbal bias. Like even without measuring the unobserved confounders U, here represented by this dashed by direct arrow. Uh, and Card argues uh, in this that famous paper is that the presence of a nearby college may be such a, an instrumental variable, so mainly for two reasons. First, the students who grew up far from college may face higher costs of education, so that, that does indeed change your incentives to get more or less uh, years of education. And second, and most import importantly, we need to believe that proximity to college is not itself confounded with earnings and does not affect uh, earnings beyond its effect on the years of, of, of education. So uh, if you're willing to believe those assumptions, uh, then we can use IV regression to estimate the two returns to schooling. And, and we're going to get a point estimate of 13.2%, which is perhaps surprising because it's almost twice as much as the 7.5% of the OLS regression. I'm going to show you details on how to compute this next. But the natural question here is, well, proximity to college is not literally randomized. So couldn't we have the same original sin that OLS suffers, right? Like, um, and the answer here is yes. So in causal inference, we never have free lunch. So we only get the result because we're making two strong assumptions. So in general, there are, main, there are two main threats to the validity of an IV estimate. The first one is that the instrument may not be quote unquote as good as random. And there could be an observed confounders that affect both uh, our instrument and our outcome. And second, even if the instrument is random, for example, uh, a randomized control trial with an incentive to take a treatment, uh, our instrument could affect the out outcome uh, other through its effect on the treatment, such as through uh, W2 in this DAG. And arguably, uh, one can make the argument that this is the case in Card's example. For instance, we could think of family wealth or better regional indicators are likely confounders of proximity, and we did not measure these variables. So although we propose IV as a solution to the omitted variable bias problem, uh, our IV estimate itself may suffer from OVB. And the question we would like to answer here is how are, would our inferences have changed had we accounted uh, for these omitted variables W, both for violations of the exclusion and in, uh, ignorability uh, uh, assumptions in our analysis, okay? Now, to give a precise answer to this question, we need to understand a bit uh, about how IV estimation works. So, so since I don't know the background of all of you, I'm gonna briefly review uh, the main approaches to IV estimation before we get to, to why we can use those sensitivity tools I showed you for, for IV as well. So let's start with uh, indirect least squares and two-stage least squares because these are the most popular uh, estimators for instrumental variables. So for ind indirect least squares, you usually start with uh, two different regressions. The first one is usually called the first stage regression. And the idea of the first stage is to capture the effect of the instrument on the treatment. And in our example, we find that those who grew up near college indeed obtained on average an extra 0.3 years of education. Now, the idea of the reduced farm regression is to capture the effect of the instrument on the outcome. And in our example, we indeed find that those that, who grew up near college had on average a 4.25% higher earnings. Now, know that if Z is actually randomized, these are actual causal effects too. Okay, but uh, they do not need to be, if we do not have like a, a, an actual randomized uh, treatment, sorry, instrument. Now to obtain, uh, so these are measuring the effects of the instrument, but we want the effect of the treatment itself. And to obtain the effect of the treatment on the outcome, our IV estimate, we simply take the ratio of these two OLS coefficients. And that's what gives us the estimate of 13.2% returns to schooling that we had before. And a closely related approach is called two stages squares. And here, what we're going to do is going to save the predictions of the first stage regression. We're going to call this D hat. And then we are going to regress the outcome on those predictions. And the coefficient attached to D hat on this regression is the two stages squares estimate. And for our purposes, the important thing to know here is that this is actually numerically identical 
to indirectly squares, it, it is just the ratio of the uh, reduced form and, and first stage regressions. Uh, now, we're dealing here with the just identified case of one instrument and one treatment, okay? Uh, just, just to make it clear for, for folks. Now, I, I just wanna briefly review the Anderson rubbing approach for, for making inferences of, of this uh, IVS demand of the ratio. So uh, here we're gonna take a different approach. We're gonna start by guessing that the true causal effect of D1Y has some specific values, say tau naught. Then we are gonna construct this auxiliary outcome, Y sub tau naught, where we subtract from Y, this putative causal effect of the treatment D. And know that if uh, the causal effect is really given by tau naught, and if we do really have a, a, a valid instrument, then the left-hand side of this equation should be uncorrelated with Z. So we should expect this regression coefficient phi to be equal to zero. And that's the fact that we're gonna exploit uh, on the Anderson rubing approach. So for the point estimate, we can define uh, our IV point estimate to be the value of tau naught that makes this phi exactly zero. And then I, again, we get uh, a numerically identical answer to indirectly squares and two stage least squares. And for uh, the confidence interval, instead of forcing tau naught to make it phi exactly zero, we're gonna, get collect, we're gonna collect all values of tau naught such that we do not reject the new hypothesis that phi is equal to zero. And this leads to this uh, confidence interval here of 2.5% and 28.5%. Now, there are two important facts for our purposes that we need to understand about this confidence interval. The first one is that it will include zero if and only if we cannot reject that the reduced form is zero than the numerator. And it will be unbounded if and only if we cannot reject that the first stage is equal to zero. And as a side note, this approach has correct size regardless of instrument strength. But of course, this comes at a cost because we can get unbounded confidence intervals. Uh, and that's actually an impossibility. There's a theorem saying, uh, if you wanna have nominal coverage, we do need to have unbounded confidence intervals uh, with positive probability eventually. Okay, so uh, to sum up, we have all these IV regressions that led to the same uh, point estimate of 13.9, 13.2% uh, for the returns to schooling. But these IV regressions are just for X only. Uh, and the, X, the estimate that we actually want would further adjust for W for, to account for uh, violations of unconfounded of the instruments or violation of the exclusion restriction of the instrument. So what we wanna know is, as I said, how would including W in our IV regressions have changed our inferences? So at their core, IV estimates are made up of OLS estimates. So in theory, you could leverage all the sensitivity tools for RLS that I showed you in the, the first part of the talk for the sensitivity of IV. So that's what we're gonna do. And if you come from an econometrics tradition, you probably have been told to take a serious look at your first stage and reduce from regression. So the natural question here is what can we learn about the sensitivity of the IV from this sensitivity of the first stage and reduced form alone? So as we have just seen, all, all the IV estimators have this form of the reduced form divided by the first stage. And it's easy to see here that this IV estimate will be zero if and only if the numerator is zero. So this leads to our first lesson and if you if you take anything out of it, this it should be probably this lesson, is that if you're interested in the hypothesis of zero effect, this is all you need to do is the sensitivity of the reduced form uh, of your of your regression of your instrument on, on your outcome, and that's it. So you can apply all the tools I showed you in the first part of the of the talk to your reduced form regression, and that gives you the sensitivity not only for the zero null hypothesis of the reduced form, but also for the zero null hypothesis of your causal effect of interest. Now, uh, if you look at this ratio again, you can also convince yourself that if we can let the first stage be arbitrarily close to zero, then we can make the IV estimate or IV estimate arbitrarily large in either direction, uh, either like extremely large negatively in the negative side or positive side. So this leads us to our second lesson is that uh, if we cannot rule out omitted variables that are strong enough to change the sign of the first stage, then we can also we can also rule out omitted variables that could be strong enough to make the IV estimate arbitrarily large in either direction, even if not exactly zero. Okay. 
So these results, they formally hold for all estimators I discussed here. And for confidence intervals, they actually also hold for the answer being failure approach, exactly like I'm saying here. The only thing we you change is that of instead of about talking about point estimates, we were talking about rejecting and not rejecting a certain uh, no hypothesis. Okay, so we already can do a lot with just the first stage of this form alone, but we can actually do a lot more and we can easily perform sensitive analysis of the IV estimate against any no hypothesis of interest within the Anderson Rubin framework. So how can we do that? So for a choice of tau naught, we're gonna create our putative potential outcome, this Y sub tau naught, where we subtract from Y uh, the putative causal effect. And we are gonna run our traditional Anderson Rubin regression. Now, the trick here is just to note that performing or less sensitive analysis for the new hypothesis that phi is equal to zero is exactly the sensitive analysis for the new hypothesis that the causal effect is equal to tau, tau naught. The only difference here is in the interpretation of the sensitive parameters. So now, the sensitive parameters are parameterized in terms of the residual variance, variance explained of the instrument and the residual variance explained of the untreated potential outcome, uh, Y sub tau naught. Now I'm putting this on quote, untreated potential outcome, because for you to uh, uh, interpret this Y sub tau naught as an untreated potential outcome, you need some functional form uh, assumptions, okay? Uh, but we actually don't need to test this for every value of tau naught. We can actually recover all inferences analytically by simply inverting the Anderson Rubin test with this OVB adjusted critical threshold that I showed you in the uh, first part of the talk. And we can, and with that, we can uh, get all usual OLS sensitive results for IV estimates. We can define and derive robustness values, contour plots, and so on. So I'm, I'm just about to wrap up. Uh, so I, I don't wanna show you the sensitivity table for, for the card example, because it would just repeat what I showed you for Darfur. So here I wanna show you a different sensitivity contour plot, which I, I did not show you before, uh, showing the actual lower limit and upper limit of confidence intervals instead of the point estimate or the T value. So, so these are the lower limit and upper limit of the confidence intervals uh, of the of cards example. So let's start with the left hand, high, left hand side where we have the lower limit. So in the X axis, we have the partial square of the confounder or side effects uh, with the instrument. And in the Y, uh, sorry, sorry, in the X axis, we have the partial square with the instrument and in the Y axis, we have the partial square of this confounder or, or the side effect with the untreated potential outcome that Y sub tau naught. And here we have the previously unadjusted lower limit of the confidence interval, it, it was 2.5%. And again, we are hypothesizing confounders with increasingly strength, and that could eventually bring the lower limit of the confidence interval to zero, or eventually make the lower limit unbounded, or right? minus infinity, for example. And here we have uh, bounds on, on uh, confounders or side effects as strong as SMSA. This is a regional indicator for whether you live in a, uh, a standard metropolitan area or an indicator of, of uh, ethnicity or, or race. And in the other side, we have the same plot, but now for uh, the upper limit of the confidence interval. And first, I would like you to see the, the scale of this plot. So, so we're talking about here uh, things on the order of magnitude of less than 1% of the residual variance ex explained of the instrument and around 2% of residual, vari ex residual variation explained of the untreated potential outcome. So if you're not willing to rule out that there could be some regional residual confounding as strong as a standard metropolitan area confounder, then we cannot rule out anything between minus 2% and 40% uh, for our, our cause effect of interest, which is pretty uninformative, for example, in, in, for this case. All right, so to sum up, and, and, and I, I guess I can stop here. So most instrumental variables are not really random and could affect the outcome other than through its effect on the treatment. So IV can also suffer from omitted variable bias and the bias can be worse than vanilla OLS. There, there's a famous paper by Bound and Jagger. Uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing their names correctly, uh, showing that, and, and so we should always assess the sensitivity of, of our IV estimates. 
But the good news is that assessing the sensitivity of an IV assessment is as easy as assessing the sensitivity of, of, of an RL assessment. So for the zero null hypothesis, the sensitivity of IV actually reduces to the sensitivity of the reduced form. That's it. You can do that today in your paper if you have a, 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 the need to perform the sensitivity. You can just use SenseMaker for that. Uh, we can also do the general sensitivity for IV easily uh, with the Anderson Rubin framework, exploring how postulated confounded change point estimates, lower and upper limits of confidence intervals, compute robustness values and bounds, and so on. And the sensitivity of reduced form for stage and a specific null hypothesis using the Anderson Rubin uh, regression can already be performed today using SenseMaker for RNS data. And we have under development. Uh, the full-fledged IV plots and tables that should be available soon. Uh, all right, so I think I'm, I ran out of time, so I'm gonna stop here. And uh, I, I guess, Ian, you can I jump in with, with one question that, that I had uh, put off in the Q&A for, for, for you to answer, Carlos? Um, which was a, a few people had questions uh, about the comparison of, of, well, really the first part to the uh, Altonzi et al. and uh, Oster approaches. Uh, so I don't know if you want to tackle that. Um, so the question is, what is the difference between Oster's approach? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the main difference uh, with Oster's approach is, is on the bounding procedures. Uh, so here we are parameterizing how strongly the confounder is a is associated with the treatment and, and outcome relative to some observed covariate. And Oster is not exactly doing that. She's, she, they are creating an index uh, and they are uh, making a claim about the ratio of the covariance of this index with the outcome and of the treatment. Now, this can lead to some unintuitive interpretations of, of that bound. I can show you in the paper uh, in case you wanna uh, more details. So we discussed this on the paper. Uh, I, so if you see um, section 6.3 of, of the GRSSB paper, we give further discussion on, on why this quantity does not actually reflect this idea that uh, the unobservables are more important than the observables to explain a treatment assignment. So I hope that answers the question. Great. Thanks, Carlos. I think we should move on to the discussion for now, just so that we like in the interest of time and then we can maybe answer some more questions after that all right thank you sorry for running over the time oh no perfect okay no, uh, can you guys hear me yes perfect. yes thanks um Thanks, this was a great paper, uh, the great presentation by Carlos, great paper by uh, Carlos and, uh, and Chad. Kind of to, to summarize, I, I, I think the sensitivity analysis are very important. I think they're not used enough as much as they, they should be. And uh, the current paper, the presentation uh, uh, kind of shows the new methods for, for doing sensitivity analysis uh, that are relatively simple. Uh, to use and interpret, and it, and it has software to actually implement them, um, so it, it clearly lowers the bar for actually getting these uh, these things you, used. And so I think this is a hugely important area, kind of both for theoretical uh, work as well as for practice. Uh, these things should clearly be uh, be used more. Now let me kind of start by by giving uh, three quotes. Uh, so here's one from Lima from a 1983 paper a very famous paper, let's take the con out of uh, econometrics, uh, where he argues that people should be doing more sensitivity analyses. Uh, and so the, the, these slides will be posted later so people can kind of look up the, the specific references. But so Lima argues kind of strongly in this paper that the, um, a lot of the, the empirical work in economics at the time was very fragile, that nobody really believed it, and that the solution his his path forward was to do more sensitivity analyses. Uh, around the same time, Rosenbaum and Rubin uh, um, wrote this wrote their paper on sensitivity analysis, where they proposed a particular way of uh, of doing sensitivity analysis. 
to deal with the fact that in observational studies, we're making very strong assumptions that people typically don't really believe hold exactly uh, just the way Carlos uh, uh, had on this, uh, some of his slides as well. The bottom, there's a uh, quote from, from my 2003 paper, just to kind of to, to underline that this is, this is something I, I totally agree with and kind of the, the sentiments uh, expressed in the, the paper by Hazlett and, um, and Cinelli. I completely agree with uh, we make these assumptions that are uh, we kind of we focus on these assumptions that nobody really believes hold exactly and we should be concerned kind of with the, the robustness uh, to these uh, to these assumptions. Then kind of sort of previously there have been a whole bunch of proposals for doing uh, such sensitivity analysis. Uh, kind of I mentioned the Rosenbaum and Rubin paper. Uh, and there's a whole line of work doing uh, things along those lines. There's also the, the line of work by Mansky, where he tries to refrain from any, making any assumptions about these uh, the unobserved confounders. And he, he argues that we should just report bounds on the, the objects uh, of interest. And you can view that as an extreme version of the Rosenbaum and, uh, and Rubin analysis. But as, uh, as Carlos uh, argues, these methods aren't necessarily used very widely in, uh, in empirical work. And it can, it's, it's always baffled me a bit why that is. Uh, it wasn't clear to me whether the, the bar to implement, to actually implementation is, uh, is such that people don't use them. Uh, the fact that there isn't a lot of software, there isn't necessarily a standardized way of, of doing these things, or whether the specific methods were not adequate in, uh, in describing the sensitivity, uh, the robustness issues that people were interested in. And the current paper and presentation kind of works on both these dimensions. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very much appreciated that they actually implement uh, this in R and Stata, as well as the, apparently a forthcoming Python version, so people can directly use these things. And they, they develop new, uh, useful better methods for actually doing these uh, these sensitivity analysis so this this clearly makes it much more likely that the the sensitivity analysis are actually going to be uh, be used one, one side because at some point Carlos says well sensitivity analysis are, are not very used the, the in the current literature but in some sense that's that's kind of a somewhat narrow interpretation of sensitivity analysis. One change in the, in certainly the economics, and I think more generally is kind of social science and empirical literature, that there are actually lots of robustness analysis uh, being done of, uh, of various types. And so one, one implication of that, that, that I'm not particularly thrilled with, is that papers have gotten much longer in, uh, in economics uh, over the years. People actually do all these additional supplementary analysis, trying to make the case that their main analysis are in fact robust uh, and that, that can take various forms. Kind of an early version that is, is Rosenbaum's notion of using multiple control groups uh, in settings kind of with binary treatments. Uh, Oster's work was mentioned and kind of in general, people report tend to report lots of analysis where they choose different subgroups, where they choose different sets of, uh, of covariates. And, but it's other kind of very specific robustness analysis that are not captured kind of in, the, in the, the definition of sensitivity analysis that was used here. For example, one uh, uh, test kind of for validity of designs that is used very often in regressing discontinuity designs is uh, McCrary's uh, test for the continuity actually of the condition of the density of the, the running variable and regression discontinuity designs. And these, these methods are actually very popular in uh, the empirical literature. So it's kind of still a little bit of a puzzle why some of the, the more narrowly defined sensitivity analyses are not used quite as, uh, as much. And so one way I'd, I'd like to think kind of frame these questions kind of frame the the work uh, Chad and uh, Carlos are doing is supposedly I think of a 
uh, setting where a statistical analyst is going to report the results of an observational study to a decision maker, we have to decide whether to implement a particular intervention. And so what is the, you know, this, the analyst has this whole data set. They don't want to sort of bring the whole data set to the decision maker. They want to summarize the results, uh, the relevant parts of the, of the data set to the decision maker. And so th the first two things that would typically be reported to the decision maker is, the, is an estimate of the treatment effect and some measure of, uncert of the, the statistical uncertainty of standard error or, or possibly confidence interval. And one way to think about the sensitivity analysis is what, what would be the next thing that would be useful for the decision maker to, uh, to report? And here, the, the paper kind of comes up with a very specific uh, thing. So, you know, one, sort of one summary statistic would be this robustness value. And it's kind of, a, it's a nice, what is nice about it is kind of, it's just a scalar thing. It's just adding one, one additional thing. You don't have to bring a whole new set of things. Uh, the decision maker doesn't want to be overwhelmed with all these additional things. You just want to get, uh, report one additional number that complements the first two, that complements the point estimate and the, and the standard error. And so I, I think that's a very attractive feature of, uh, of this proposal. But then, then sort of, um, and so I, I think that's kind of making it much more likely uh, that this would actually get adopted uh, more widely. But so here, here's a question, um, and it's kind of this is an open-ended question. I was thinking of this um, at, uh, at five or so in the morning, so I'm not sure exactly how well thought through this is. But so suppose I actually have two observational studies, and I'd, I'd actually like to see an example of this type uh, in in some of these papers. Suppose I have two observational studies, both with the same point estimate and the same standard error. So the first two pieces of information for the decision maker are exactly the same. But now suppose they have two different uh, robustness values, two different RV val values for the RV statistic. What does it actually tell us about these two data sets? What aspects of these data sets lead to these two different RV values? I mean, and, and I co can go through the mechanics of how these are calculated, but I, I, I would like to see more intuition for what would lead to differences in RV values. And more importantly, I would like to see examples where I would agree that the the analysis that the data set that led to the higher RV value, and I'm, I'm going to have it based on the same statistical analysis, so I'm going to have this correspond to a data set. I'm going to see a case where we can all agree that the data set with the higher RV value is uh, more or less robust than the other data set. And now, suppose, given that these two data sets would have the same point estimate and the same standard error, there still has to be something different. It could be that one data set is bigger than the other. It may have less variation. The, the bigger sample may have less variation in the treatment so that the standard errors are still the same. But they, they could still have different RV values. And would we really want to interpret that as one being more or less robust uh, than the other? And I think that would be helpful to convince people that this is a really useful measure for to bring to a decision maker, that we would really tell the decision maker to uh, to put less faith in the data set that uh, that leads to a different uh, RV value. And I think you may be able to do that even in a case where there's no other covariance, but it's just the binary treatment and an outcome and in a sufficiently large sample, so we don't have to worry about the applicability of central limit theorems, uh, or everything could be normal. But that would help me uh, gain intuition for what these uh, uh, RV values uh, really capture of, uh, in a data set. But then let me uh, pause here because we're, we're running a little late and I, I wanna allow for some questions, but this was a great talk. And I think this is a hugely important topic uh, and one where it's it's upon us to kind of find ways of, of convincing people doing empirical work to actually use more of these uh, these methods.
Uh, thanks. Well, thanks, uh, Guido. That, that, that was great. Uh, well, I can try to answer that question a little bit if we do have time. Um, do we? I mean, we, we are over time, but we can take a few minutes just to answer the questions. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's a, a perfect question. Uh, we, we've been thinking this a lot, especially now that people are using it. <clears throat> and and it, it depends on context uh, because, so if we have totally different context on the data sets, then what confounders are plausible are, are very different. But to make things easier, let's suppose we have uh, both data sets have the same likely set of potential confounders. So in the example that you give, what would that indicate is that the effect size of the estimate of the larger sample, which has the same point estimate and same standard error, but a, but a smaller RV, uh, is smaller. So 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 that uh, so that uh, estimate just have just has a same t value because it has a larger sample size, but the actual effect size is smaller, so it's more susceptible no, 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 to I, I systematic have, biases. Let's say. Sorry, I want to have a case where both the point estimate and the standard error are both the same. Not not yes. just the t statistic, but both the point the effect size must be the the same, or the estimated effect size must be the same, and the standard error, but the RV value is different. Yeah, so, so in that case, it means that the, the how much variation our treatment explains of the outcome is different. So, so in that sense, that measure of effect size is different. Uh, okay, so yeah. Meaning that if we, if we didn't account for some small systematic bias in the larger sample case, this could flip our estimates easily. Now, whether that, that is plausible or not depends on context, right? So, so that's, I think, the tricky question. For example, I've been... Uh, working with geneticists uh, now, and their effect sizes are really, really small. So, so, so we need to calibrate what is a large correlation or a small correlation. And in other areas like education, uh, for example, and, and income, the correlations are usually large. Uh, but I guess trying to give a, some answer is that what is that is indicating is that the statistical significance in the other in the other uh, data set is coming mostly because of the larger sample size, uh, but that data set is more susceptible to some sort, sort of uh, systematic bias that could explain who got the treatment and who did not get the treatment. Yeah, no, no, so, so that, that was kind of my, my intuition for the way it would go. So you would end up saying, I have these two data sets, both have a point estimate of three and a standard error, say, of 1.5. And now I'm, I'm going to trust the smaller data set more. Yeah, that sounds common. So it's, it's a, a sense exactly, I agree kind of, with you. Now I'm, I'm framing it kind of in this way because that, that makes it sound a little funny. But, but in some sense, I think that's kind of the challenge where so uh, I want to find an example where the, the point estimates are the same and the standard errors are the same. And we kind of, we all are going to say, yes, clearly this one data set is more credible than the other. And here, but, it's but, not completely But if you think obvious. about it, if we, let's suppose we have a data set with like a billion observations, right? And then we have a T value of three, two. Then when we actually compute the part, the, how much variation that treatment explains of the outcome, we're gonna see it's really, really tiny. And any imperfection, even like a small measurement error or a small systematic bias from our, uh, for example, in genetics, uh, high throughput processing data, could explain that super statistically significant estimate, right? So, uh, yeah, I think I think that's something because we didn't use sensitive analysis a lot. That's something we're going to have to learn by doing. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm not sure if I have the perfect answer for that. No, no, I say, so my, but I, I don't know the, the answer either. But at some level, I feel that it's sort of the yeah the sort of some of the the examples, and I, this is not. I think this is in other papers as well. People look at, at these sensitivity analysis and say, well, this analysis is more or less sensitive, but it's partly because the estimate is bigger or the standard error is smaller. But you, I, and that's why I wanted to frame it as sort of, given that we have these four first two things in place and they're the same, what, what does the, the sensitivity analysis, analysis tell, tell us beyond that? <clears throat> 
Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt again, but we're really <laughs> over time, so maybe this discussion can be continued offline and yes. uh, we will wrap up for the audience now. Thank you so much for a really nice discussion and a really great talk. We've had a really great turnout and a lot of interesting questions have been answered on the discussion by Chad, so thank you, Chad, also. Next week, we will have Shinran Lee from UIUC. Uh, giving a talk on randomization inference beyond the sharp null, bounded null hypothesis, and quantiles of individual treatment effects. So we hope to see, see you all there. Thank you for your patience and uh, for being here. That's all. Thank you all. I just want to thank you, everyone, again. And thank you, Guido, so much for being so generous with your time. Um, no, no, this was fun. This is, this is great. Uh, I, I think this is, 